Great. Thank you, Dirk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the snake research was interesting. I did that my uh, freshman year of, of college because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. Turns out I love snakes, but I'm not a huge fan of snake research. So uh, so I decided to go a different path. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the today's talk is on, uh, as Dirk said, uh, optimal grading and segmentation of uh, EPVS and their applications of stroke. Uh, so I had a paper published uh, last year, early this year, last year, uh, uh, on machine learning, deep learning applications to automated grading of enlarged crevasse spaces, specifically with clinical imaging. Uh, so a lot of the applications, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but a lot of the applications that have been developed are for uh, super high resolution or, or you know, 7T magnet straights uh, kind of uh, protocols that aren't necessarily applicable to clinical situations. <laughs> Uh, so here at the University of Cincinnati, we're a large uh, stroke uh, center, a comprehensive stroke center. Uh, NIH StrokeNet is uh, actually right across the street from the building that I work in, uh, the main headquarters. So it's, uh, you know, a, a really, and the other ones at MUSC, uh, ironically enough. So, uh, so it's a really big topic, and we have a lot of really great epidemiological stroke data sets with clinical imaging to kind of test uh, effects of small vessel disease and such. So while my previous research was really focused on brain connectivity and still some of my side projects, my main focus right now is developing uh, AI applications. And by AI, I usually say augmented intelligence instead of artificial, because I think that's more accurate of what we're trying to do. Uh, but AI approaches to... Uh, small vessel disease in general, uh, but specifically uh, Roger Newman-Norland from your, from your guys' group reached out and asked if uh, I was interested in collaborating on EPVS and, and their stroke co cohort that they have. Uh, so that's kind of the background. So I want to start out just by saying uh, what perivascular spaces are. There's a few different definitions in the literature, uh, a few different, uh, you know, controversial points about what this actually refers to. So I just wanted to give a a definition of what I'm referring to when I talk about PBS. Uh, so it's literally just the space between uh, the vasculature uh, and the brain. And here you can see kind of the structure uh, of that. So here you have the astrocytes and the astrocytic infeet uh, that kind of attach to the pia matter. Then you have the smooth muscle and then the actual uh, artery itself. Uh, I'll mainly be speaking about arteries. I'll mention veins a little bit, but there's some controversial opinions on whether these are relevant in veins. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll get to that a little later. Uh, an important phenomenon that happens is that as the artery gets smaller, uh, as you would expect, the PVS uh, gets larger. So a lot of the PVS that we're looking at, especially in clinical grade imaging with, uh, you know, relatively low spatial resolution is the uh, perivascular spaces around the smaller arterioles and even some of the capillaries. Uh, so let's see. So what's the function of the PVS? So uh, the main function uh, in the literature is that it's really a place where CSF and interstitial fluid ISF is drained and also uh, a way that the brain can clear out the gunk that, you know, shouldn't be in there. So uh, a lot of the focus is on uh, Alzheimer's disease and amyloid plaques that build up uh, and the clearing of amyloid uh, through this PBS system. Uh, so there's two different kind of hypotheses. The glyphatic was the kind of the original uh, hypothesis on how this might work, and that is that the, the uh, the PVS has this fluid that goes through, and then this fluid, all the gunk gathers, and then it's transferred by aquaporin uh, receptors through the astrocytes, uh, and then into the venous uh, flow, and then it's, uh, you know, uh, taken out of the brain by the venous flow. Uh, but there's, like I said, there's some controversy on whether or not that these are actually as relevant in, in venous flow. So uh, there's a kind of a newer model and it could be both of these, but there's kind of a newer model of how this might work, the intramural uh, periarterial drainage system or the iPad. And uh, basically, this is more of a, a passive system uh, where the substances uh, such as amyloid are uh, actively or sorry, passively transferred between the arterial and the PVS, the kind of interstitial space. Uh, and then it's actually the vasomotion uh, of the arterial that pumps, that helps pump the, the PVS in the opposite direction as the blood flow. So it's kind of a, a more condensed single system where the blood's flowing in and then around it, the PVS, uh, all that fluid is flowing in the opposite direction to evacuate anything out of the brain that's not wanted. So <clears throat> there's a little bit of uh, controversy around this. Basically, people have come up with computational models that show that just the vasomotion isn't powerful enough to actually pump the fluid. Uh, so there's some other 
uh, you know, theories about what might be happening, including some of the smooth muscle cells having, you know, dual function of also pumping out the, the stuff in the PVS, uh, all the fluid in the PVS. Uh, but these are, this is kind of the, the mechanisms that we're looking at when we talk about the perivascular space. So the next relevant question is uh, why did these become enlarged and kind of why is it a problem? <clears throat> so there's a, there's a lot of different reasons. There's the loss of arterial pulsatile flow as you age. I will say the biggest risk factor for these so far seems to be aging. Uh, and I think a lot of that is just the kind of natural things that come with aging. Uh, like I said, reduction of arterial post off flow, increase in the vascular membrane, uh, basement membrane thickness, uh, inability of collagen to repair vascular damage, uh, loss of aquaporin polarization, so less efficient transfer of those uh, molecules across the different membranes. Uh, of course, cardiovascular risk factors, so high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, breakdown of the blood brain barrier. Uh, but in summary, uh, I think the consensus is that these get enlarged because there's dysfunctional clearing of brain waste. Uh, so what happens <clears throat> is that these compounds build up in that PVS and they're not efficiently evacuated or transferred into the bloodstream. So they kind of build up and that literally causes a mechanical like, uh, you know, enlargement of the PVS. So then the next logical question is like, why, why should we care? Why is this important? Uh, and it's actually more controversial than you might think. Uh, there's been very mixed results in terms of the clinical implications of this, and I'll get into why I think that might be in a minute. Uh, but, you know, some studies have shown, uh, one of the largest studies in over like 2,500 uh, adults show that these aren't really related to cognition. Uh, but then there's other studies, smaller studies, uh, that maybe use more precise methods in quantifying these EPVS that show that they are related to uh, cognitive decline and uh, more accurate prognosis of Alzheimer's disease, uh, and especially after stroke. Uh, so there's definitely ongoing uh, research about what the actual clinical implications of this uh, you know, if PVS are, and uh, how can, how we can address these uh, risk factors to decrease these, uh, you know, clinical sequelae. So now into why I think that maybe, uh, you know, the clinical implications are a bit, uh, you know, mixed. Uh, one, I think the previous methods are, uh, you know, made progress in this field, but I don't think that they uh, maybe optimally address the problem of PVS quantification. Uh, so the, one of the first papers that really looked at this uh, in terms of EPVS grading uh, was this paper by Dubost uh, and his group. Uh, he's actually coming out with a special issue on perivascular spaces and frontiers uh, in neuroscience. Uh, so looking forward to that, to seeing kind of the progress in the field. Uh, but they used a basic uh, convolutional network, a residual network, uh, to try to classify different areas of the brain, uh, specifically the hippocampus, uh, the basal ganglia and the central semio valley uh, using a zero to four rating scale, which I'll get into in just a minute. Uh, but some of the limitations of this is that they used uh, 1.5 Tesla, uh, which is fine. That's you know clinically applicable, especially in like community hospitals, uh, but their scans were super high resolution. So like 0 0.5, 0 0.5 by 0 0.8. Uh, so we're talking sub-millimeter in all three directions, uh, and that really is not clinically feasible, especially in the acute setting. Uh, and the, the results were pretty good. Uh, there was also a lot of, you know, very in-depth processing where they actually crop the image around these certain uh, structures uh, to make these judgments. Uh, so I think it's a good first step. There's definitely some limitations that limit its translatability uh, to the clinic. Uh, another recent work, uh, this is Art Toga's group, uh, at USC, uh, they came up with this perivascular uh, space enhancement method. Uh, basically, you know, it sounds a lot more complicated than the actual paper, but what they're all they're doing is doing some basic pre-processing, some bias field correction of the T1 and T2, uh, skull stripping, co-registration, co and then doing some denoising using non-local filtering. And this is kind of the standard, you know, denoising I think that most people use nowadays. Uh, to do uh, denoising images, and they just simply divide the T1 by the T2. And I'll show you some examples of, of uh, how that enhances the perivascular spaces and makes it a little easier to, to grade and segment. And then finally, uh, and there hasn't been many approaches, honestly, to trying to do this. Uh, and then, uh, but one of the 
few that actually tried to segment the perivascular spaces is this approach by uh, Ballerini, and he's out of Joanna Ward Law's group at the University of Edinburgh, uh, who I really think are probably the group that are uh, studying PVS the most, especially in stroke. Uh, so they had a fairly, you know, complex pipeline uh, using frangy filters uh, where they tried to, to segment the PVS and a number of patients. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later because I'm actually using uh, a modified version of this for the pipeline I'm developing. Uh, but there are some limitations to that, namely that their code is not open source at all. So it's impossible to actually see what they're doing. Uh, their uh, methods were very general, uh, not, you know, there weren't a lot of specifics in there. So when I was trying to recreate this, it was actually kind of a struggle to figure out what the details were. Uh, and they might be different from what they did in the paper because they didn't really say a lot about what they did uh, per se. Uh, and then another limitation was that it didn't do a great job in the Centrum Simeo Valley. Uh, it corresponded pretty well to neural uh, radiological ratings in the basal ganglia, uh, but was not directly applicable to the Centrum Simeo Valley. Uh, so I think there's still some limitations with this method uh, that we could probably overcome uh, with some reasonable methodological choices. So that brings me to the, the pipeline that I kind of came up with. Uh, so. Uh, when Roger reached out, I, I tried to run it through a network that I already had that I was working on for some of our data, and it wasn't going super well. Uh, I think the accuracy was somewhere around 70%, uh, something like that for grading. Uh, so I thought, what if we just try to quantify these and uh, base the grading on the automatic quantification since we have the T1 and the T2 uh, in this data set that I'm working on with Roger. Uh, so I decided why not try to combine, you know, what's been done so far to try to get in kind of an optimal segmentation pipeline and then base our EPVS grading uh, on the number of segment to PVS from that segmentation. So step one, I'm doing the what the Artoga group did and creating this enhanced perivascular space contrast image, the EPC image. Uh, after that, I'm using the frangy filter method of these, uh, this work by Ballerini. He has a couple of other papers out, but it's all kind of the same uh, principle. Uh, I will say at this point, the, the rating scale they use is also out of Joanna Wardlaw's group, uh, and it's a zero to four rating scale. Uh, obviously, zero, zero, one is one to 10 uh, perivascular spaces, two, 11 to 20, three, 21 to 40, and four, more than 40 uh, perivascular spaces. Uh, there are other uh, rating scales, like from Patankar, but uh, this is the one from Wardlaw's group who, that's been uh, used the most in the literature and has kind of been validated uh, with some cognitive data. Uh, again, there's some, I think, limitations with some of the work that they've done, uh, but at least there's something there to go off of. And then finally, uh, I'm working with a graduate student in engineering, uh, developing a really cool uh, neural network uh, called a cross-attention network, and I'll go into that more later. Uh, I was originally just going to use like a standard UNET, uh, but he kind of told me that this might be a better uh, way of going about it. So we're trying to develop together an optimal cross-attention network to clean up the segmentations uh, from step two. All right, so in step one, uh, I like I said, I, I generate this EPC image, uh, and this is specifically for stroke data uh, because I'm masking out the lesion. I think that's probably the simplest way to go. Uh, Roger and I talked a little bit about like an anti-morphic healing, uh, something like that. Uh, typically for me, uh, for this kind of pipeline, I just like to mask out that region. Uh, you know, EPVS aren't necessarily symmetric across uh, the, you know, across the brain, so I don't want to fill in with uh, you know, a guess of what that tissue might be and assume that it might be symmetric to the other side. I, I really like to just kind of ignore that and kind of work with what we have until we come up with a better method of, uh, of quantifying what that might look like uh, in, within a lesion. So the first thing is lesion segmentation. Luckily, uh, Roger's group already provided me with that with the T1, the T2, and the lesion segmentation. Uh, then, like I said, brain extraction of the T1 and T2, bias correction, registration of the T2 and the lesion, which is in T2 space to the T1, uh, the denoising using adaptive non-local means, which is this uh, non-local filtering that they used in this paper. Uh, and then importantly, one of the uh, 
one of the caveats of using this method for this purpose is that you have to uh, smooth with a radius of one. It's basically like a signal smoothing instead of a spatial smoothing. Uh, so it tries to denoise uh, a voxel based on the surrounding signal uh, in, the, in the surrounding voxels. Typically, yeah, I think the default here is to use a voxel uh, neighborhood of three or four voxels. Uh, but when you do that, it might mask some of the PVS because when the PVS show up on the images, uh, again, which I'll show a little bit later, they're very small. So we're talking about like super punctate, especially compared to like clinical resolution, uh, imaging resolution. We're talking about very small kind of pathology here. So if you smooth with any uh, radius greater than one, uh, then some of that can be masked out. Uh, which is what we don't want. So this might introduce a little bit more noise, but it also keeps uh, the signal that we want. And then finally, the division of the T1 and the T2. Uh, I use a little bit of an eroded brain mask here to exclude uh, some of the outer values around the brain because I was finding that uh, those give you know values that you don't want in this kind of analysis, like infinities and nans. So uh, I just cut out some of that noise by eroding uh, the mask by two voxels uh, to cut out that noise. And here's an example uh, using uh, one of the data sets that Roger shared with me. Uh, so here's the T1, the T2, and then the, the EPC image. Uh, so you can really see here the T1 is not much used to us in terms of the perivascular spaces. Uh, there's just way too much kind of noise uh, around the image to really delineate what is what. Uh, here, the T2, you can kind of pick them out uh, as you go. But again, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, artifacts associated with T2 imaging that could also look like perivascular spaces. So uh, there's still a lot of noise here. You could probably segment some of these, you know, uh, for example, like this set's pretty clear uh, and you could always window the image to make it a little clearer. Uh, but then when you divide these two and get the EPC image, you can really see that these pop out uh, pretty clearly. Uh, so like some of these over here that you really can't see in the T2 really pop out and you can see these nice uh, boundaries around some of these perivascular spaces that aren't as clear in the T2. Uh, so this is why I chose to use the EPC image uh, to do the segmentation because I really think that uh, it can be optimized to, uh, to segment these accurately. All right, step two. This was definitely the most... Uh, complicated part of the pipeline, even more so than the cross attention network at the end. Uh, again, I think that one of the reasons is because the methods in the in the Ballerini papers, he has three of them now that uh, just weren't really that clear on what they were doing. Uh, so there was a lot of kind of fine tuning that needed to be done. Uh, so the first thing that you do is you train an ordered logit model to kind of get an uncertainty estimate on, uh, on the perivascular space segmentation number that you get. Uh, so to do this, uh, you take, I took a thousand random samples from a log normal distribution. Uh, you choose a log normal because that's kind of what you see in uh, population studies of EPPS. So uh, there's very few with no uh, perivascular spaces. Uh, there's quite a few with either one to 10 or 10 to 20 uh, perivascular spaces. And then there's a kind of precipitous drop off after that. So you kind of get that nice log normal distribution. Uh, I also capped it at 100 PVS. Whoops, sorry. Uh, at 100 uh, PVS for the random samples. Uh, this wasn't specifically stated in the original paper, but all of the uh, all of the plots that they showed were capped at 60, 80, 100. So I assume that's kind of what they did. I mean, I think it would be really not very clinically useful to delineate 100 from 150 perivascular spaces. I think at that point, it's kind of uh, severe enough where that delineation doesn't matter. Uh, and this kind of cleaned up the uh, cutoff estimates from the ordered logit model uh, that I implemented after. Uh, and then after that, you add uncertainty to each of these random samples uh, by taking a sample from a normal distribution with a mean at that random sample uh, and then a standard deviation of one. Uh, so what that means is that every, uh, every bit of uncertainty that you add can add a maximum or subtract a maximum of three from that count. Uh, which I think keeps it in a reasonable range. Uh, I, this is something that I could definitely play with in later, you know, Im implementations of this pipeline. Uh, but for now, I just kept it kind of standard. Uh, and then I generate the PVS class based on these noisy uh, numbers. And, and again, it's based on this scale, uh, the word law scale. And then I fit an ordered logit regression with these classes and the original random sample. Uh, before the uncertainty was added. So that gives me a nice uh, fit uh, to a model. And then here's the model that I come up with. Uh, again, you can see that most of the time the 
model's pretty certain based on the number of what class these belong to, uh, but there are these tails that give it just a little bit of uncertainty to kind of capture the uncertainty of what you would see from a neuroradiologist trying to count these and pick these out. Uh, again, I think the standard deviation is probably a little larger than this, but I just wanted to stick to this method as closely as possible for this initial go through. All right, so then step two, part two, is the actual PVS segmentation. Uh, so first for each subject, I generate an EPC image, uh, and then I register ROIs to the EPC by using the subject T1. I'll go over ROI selection uh, in the next couple slides. Uh, I normalize the EPC image using a min-max normalization, so all the values are between zero and one. Uh, and then I adjust based on quantile. I'll also go over that a little bit later because uh, that ended up being a pretty important step. Uh, and then I segment the PVS uh, on the quantile adjusted EPC using a frangy filter. It's actually a, a multi-level frangy filter, so it's a little bit more complicated, but it's the same basic principle. Uh, and then I convert the vesselness scores that you get from the frangy, frangy filter into T values and threshold based on that. Uh, so, so now I'll go into the explanation of ROIs. Uh, so when you read about these PVS, uh, in previous studies, you see that they're focusing on two main areas. Uh, one is the basal ganglia and two is the syndrome semiovalli. Uh, you also get gradings, like I said, in the hippocampus and the midbrain. Typically, the midbrain is too noisy in these clinical images to really give a decent estimate. Uh, so clinicians often just ignore that uh, area when they're making PBS judgments. Uh, the hippocampus uh, is usually zero, uh, you know, for most people or, you know, very few. Uh, so we just had a population study of 4,500 acute stroke patients uh, from around the region. I think like 96% of them had either a zero or one rating. So it's not really a useful area in terms of, of this kind of uh, gradation that we're looking for. Uh, so that leaves the basal ganglia and the central semi valley is kind of the two areas of interest. Uh, and then more specifically, the basal ganglia is the one that's been associated more with uh, cognitive decline. Uh, so when you're looking at total cerebral small vessel disease burden, uh, they really are just looking at the basal ganglia score. I think for two reasons. One is because it's such a, you know, intrinsic part of that midbrain to basal ganglia uh, pathway that is so involved in neurodegenerative disease. Uh, but also, I think the Centrum Semi Valley estimates are just a little more uncertain and noisy than the basal ganglia. Uh, so that leaves us with these two, uh, you know, uh, vascular territories that we're really interested in. One is the PBS of these lenticular striate arteries that perforate uh, from the MCA up into the basal ganglia. And the other one is these uh, perforating medullary arteries that go around the outside uh, of the cortex and then perforate into uh, the white matter from the outside. So because of that, uh, I decided to restrict the analysis uh, to just try just the Citrum Semio Valley and the basal ganglia. Uh, basal ganglia is pretty straightforward because there's a lot of atlases that define the uh, basal ganglia, but the Centrum Semio Valley is not nearly as straightforward because I don't think, I, at least I couldn't find uh, an atlas that specifically tried to delineate the, the CS. Uh, so this is how I created the mask for the analysis. Uh, I used the in-tissue segmentation of the ants atropo uh, segmentation uh, with three tissue classes. Uh, so that gave me gray matter. It gave me kind of a white matter plus basal ganglia, and then it gave me CSF. Uh, I extracted the CSF mask. I dilated it by four voxels and inverted it, and that's just to mask out. Uh, you know, everything that's in the CSF as opposed to keep everything that's in the CSF. Uh, I dilate it because the frangy filter picks up the edges uh, of the ventricles as uh, vessels, even though they're not. Uh, so I, you know, I wanted to keep out the noise that kind of happens uh, right at the junction of the CSF uh, and the gray matter there, uh, especially like the caudate. Uh, and I'll show an example of that later too. Uh, and then I extract the white matter mask from the end tissue segmentation. And then I take only the top 40% of the slices going from inferior to superior. Uh, so that's kind of what you see here. So I've only taken the top 40% uh, of the slices here to try to get that, you know, Centrum Sigma Valley, Corona Radiata kind of top of the white matter. Uh, I think this is a hyperparameter that we can probably tune, uh, but I'm not sure how much uh, effect it will have on the final results. Uh, and then I aligned the basal ganglia regions, which I took from the PD-25 atlas, uh, to the subject uh, using, like I said, the subject T1 and the T1 provided uh, from that atlas 
uh, and then I combine the trimmed white matter, uh, the aligned basal ganglia, and then multiply it by the inverted CSF to get rid of those kind of ed, uh, noisy edge regions. Uh, I'll say that this is probably the most delicate uh, but important part of this whole process, uh, just because uh, you know the frangy filter is non-specific to like the actual like brain tissue, right? So it picks up all the the sulci and all the uh, like I said, the CSF, uh, you know, areas like that where there is dark uh, versus bright contrast, it picks up all of that as vesselness uh, when it's really not what we're looking for. Uh, and then all the papers that I referred to before, this step is very, uh, you know, is not very well defined. They just say we use some like masking methods uh, to, to clean up the images. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can decide on a kind of a standardized procedure of how to mask these out, uh, at least the ones that we're interested in uh, for future, you know, for future reference. Uh, so now I just want to give a brief explanation of the multi-scale frangy filter. I'm not a mathematician, uh, so I can't go into a ton of detail, but I can at least give a general overview. And if anybody has any corrections, please feel free to correct, you know, when it's question time. Uh, but basically, you, you have the Hessian of, uh, for any given voxel, you take the Hessian, which is the second order partial derivative based on the intensity values uh, in a, you know, in a spatial neighborhood around that voxel. Uh, and then you can calculate, uh, you do an, uh, you know, eigenvector decomposition. Uh, so then you have your primary eigenvalues on the diagonal. And based on those eigenvalues, you can kind of tell the geometry of the underlying signal. Uh, it's very similar to diffusion imaging. My expertise is actually in diffusion imaging. Uh, it's not in uh, specifically in structural imaging. Uh, so when I think of this, I immediately think of the diffusion tensor uh, and kind of the properties that you can gain from that. Uh, and then this is kind of the vesselness uh, score that you can generate from that. Uh, for our specific purpose, we're looking for dark spots on a bright background. Uh, so in that case, you're looking for if eigenvalue two and three are greater than zero, uh, then the vesselness is uh, you know, represented by this equation. Uh, it's zero otherwise. So that just kind of gives you that uh, round structure that you're looking for. Otherwise, it's more of a line structure of eigenvector one, which is the principal direction. Uh, is far greater than two and three, uh, then you kind of get a line instead of a circle structure. Uh, so we're looking for these dark circles on the bright background, basically. Uh, these are some of the, you know, terms that you have uh, in this equation. Uh, I only put these in here uh, because these uh, optimization parameters are very relevant to these three uh, parameters. So I'll go into those in a minute. Uh, and then what makes this a multi-scale frangy filter as opposed to a traditional frangy filter is that you uh, test this over a range of spatial neighborhoods and then just take the maximum value for each voxel within that spatial neighborhood. Uh, so while this uh, you know, method is very powerful, uh, it also gives you a lot of parameters that you could potentially optimize uh, for any given problem. Uh, so the first three are the alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, I won't go into these in too much detail because my analysis and also previous analyses showed that optimizing these is really just a waste of time, that they really don't improve the results that much at the cost of you know, high computational times of trying to iterate through different values. Uh, the alpha is the weight ratio between uh, the second and third eigenvalues. So this is that RA term here. And you can see up here, it's scaled by alpha. Uh, the beta is the weight ratio of the first eigenvalue compared to the second and third. Uh, so that's that you know, line versus circle kind of delineation that I was talking about. And here it's scaled by beta. And then finally, the gamma is the weight of the Frobenius norm of the Hessian. Uh, and that's basically just control for background noise. I can't, like I said, I can't get into too much detail about what that is because uh, I don't know those specifics. Uh, but I, I know that changing this parameter across a scale of you know, zero to 500 really has no effect on the final uh, result. Uh, so the two that I'm really interested in uh, for this analysis uh, is the uh, sigma uh, min and sigma max, which you see here, which is the spatial scale that the algorithm is looking for. Uh, and it's uh, in, sorry, like, it's in 10 steps. So basically, it takes the sigma min, uh, takes 10 even interval steps uh, between the sigma min and the sigma max, and calculates uh, the vesselness at each of those different iterations. Uh, and then the result is the maximum vesselness for that voxel across that spatial scale. Uh, so that's my very rudimentary explanation, understanding of the uh, frangy filter. I'm happy for anyone to chime in at the end with any uh, further details that might be relevant.
so then after I do that segmentation, uh, or once that's set up, I can do a Bayesian optimization of those parameters. Uh, there's also two more parameters that I optimize. One is the T-thresh, which is that uh, T-threshold I, I mentioned before, uh, where you generate the uh, the T-score, which is just an interquartile range normalization uh, of the PVS, and then the EPC quantile. So this is an interesting uh, thing that I came across is that in some of these images, uh, the difference between normal or you know adjacent tissue and the PVS uh, was just not stark enough for the Frangie filter to pick it up. Uh, so what I did is I took, uh, for example, in this analysis, the upper uh, thirty percent of the values and just increase those to one, uh, and that gave me a lot more contrast between the PVS and the surrounding tissue. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I was doing that optimally, so I included that as an optimization parameter. Uh, it turns out that uh, you know it didn't really have a huge effect on the final results, uh, but I definitely think it helped the final uh, likelihood uh, go go up. So uh, to obtain the PVS count uh, for this model, I. I Segmented, segmented it for a certain set of given parameters. Uh, I took the slice with the densest PVS segmentation, uh, and then I extracted that from the 3D data set. And then I used 2D clustering with the minimum segment size of five pixels uh, to get the number of unique clusters. Uh, so I use this method because if you just use the 3D volume, there's like way more PVS than what you're getting. It's a completely different scale uh, than what you're seeing on this. So the way that neuroradiologists typically count these, uh, and they don't do it often, but when they do, uh, they go to the slice with the most, go up a slice, down a slice, just to make sure they're, uh, they're continuous. Uh, and then they take that slice and count the individual PVS uh, on that single slice. Uh, so uh, this leads me to the termination of this uh, PI in this equation, which I'll go over in a minute. Uh, so what you're really relying on for the, for the optimization uh, is obtaining the class probabilities from the ordered logit model that I, fit, that I was talking about that I fit earlier. Uh, and then I give that estimated number of clusters or unique PVS uh, to that model. It generates probabilities for each of the four classes. And then I take the expert rating uh, so we have neuroradiological ratings on uh, each of these subjects. I used kind of a, uh, the best 35 subjects from the data set. Uh, and we have neuroradiological readings that one of our neuroradiolo sorry, neuroradiologists performed. Uh, and then you basically index those probability values by whatever, uh, whatever the expert rating was. So that gives you the probability of the actual number of PVS versus the, the probability of the estimated number of PVS from the neuroradiologist. Uh, so basically to optimize this equation, this is the log likelihood. It's just the summation uh, of the log probabilities, uh, of the sum of the log probabilities. So uh, yeah, so it's a pretty like simple, I think, uh, likelihood estimation, uh, but it's really dependent on those expert ratings uh, to generate these initial optimized values. Uh, so these are the results. Uh, log likelihood, the final was negative 296.34. Uh, this was pretty comparable to what the Ballerini papers were getting. They were only using, I think, 20, 21 subjects uh, for their optimization. They were getting something around like negative 150 for their log likelihood. Uh, so with those added subjects, I think this is pretty reasonable, uh, you know, indicating that hopefully I replicated the method uh, pretty closely. Uh, so these are the optimized parameters. You can kind of see by these plots uh, which parameters had the most effect on the log likelihood. So this is log likelihood in the y-axis, and then this is the different parameters in the x. Uh, so S-men definitely had, you know, uh, roughly a linear relationship uh, with a log likelihood. Uh, S-max, kind of the opposite, though it's a little bit more noisy. Uh, so, uh, and then EPC quantile, like I said, it seems pretty random to me. I don't think it had much of an effect, uh, though you definitely get the most extreme values uh, at the highest EPC quantile. Uh, and these ranges were all, uh, you know, zero to two here. This is actually a little bit bigger. This was 0.1 to 0.9. So those end values are included uh, in this. I just want to point that out. And then here is probably the most interesting pattern of this T-threshold. Uh, this went all the way up to three. Uh, this is just the, the maximum uh, cutoff here. 
Uh, but you can see that there's really uh, a nice U-shaped pattern, but really the most, uh, you know, the highest log likelihood when this T threshold uh, goes down below, you know, 0.25. So this kind of gives me an idea of how much these parameters are actually playing, uh, you know, in the procedure. Uh, for future, you know, applications of this, uh, maybe I try to optimize the EPC quantile again. Maybe I just set it at, you know, 0 0.65, 0 0.7, uh, and then save some computational time. Uh, doing that. So this is an example of the segmentation that I get from that process. Uh, so you, here you can see it does a pretty good job of segmenting the PVS. Uh, there's definitely still some noise, right? If you look at like kind of the interface between white matter and gray matter or, you know, CSF, sulci and, and the brain, uh, you can kind of see some noise still exists in these images. Uh, but all in all, it does a pretty good job, even picking up, you know, PVS that are really, really kind of hard to see on the standard T2 that people usually use to judge these, right? So these small kind of punctate uh, PVS that you see here all just kind of look like a blur here. And I think that's really what you're getting from the EPC image and the, and the frangy filter is the advantage of getting these like super small uh, punctate PVS. Like I said, so in these images, there there is still some noise. Obviously, for the presentation, I chose one of the better examples. There are, you know, a few examples. I would say 10% of the examples uh, out of the 106 or so that I've done so far uh, that are, you know, pretty far off, uh, and then the rest are, you know, reasonably close to what I'm showing here. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm getting the most accurate perhaps even, you know, a little conservative estimate of the number of PBS uh, in these patients. Uh, so I was thinking about different ways to kind of clean the noisy segmentations. Uh, I came across a couple of really good review papers on uh, deep learning techniques. Uh, I usually don't use that word. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I know it's common parlance. I typically like, you know, neural networks uh, better. So I use these, uh, you know, I read a nice review of all these different uh, neural network approaches to uh, to clean up noisy segmentations or noisy classifications uh, that are generated either from like computer error or uh, even iterator reliability issues. Uh, and I think the most prominent one that kept coming out, and I talked to, like I said, my graduate student Balaji uh, about, you know, the state of the art. He's much more up to date on the most, you know, state of the art methods uh, in this kind of realm. Uh, he'd, and I think we came up with the cross attention network as the kind of uh, you know optimal architecture for for this problem, uh, so basically what you do is uh, a standard unit. If you're you know if you're familiar with uh, kind of neural network segmentation and medical imaging, you're bound to see a unit before. <clears throat> so this is kind of a basic unit architecture, but you have these added attention blocks, uh, and what this gives you is it gives you these features. Uh, these kind of higher and higher level features informing the reconstruction back up in this uh, second pathway. So this is kind of uh, encoding all of the features that you're interesting in, interested in going down this pathway. And then here you're decoding those features into the final segmentation. So adding this attention kind of tells the network uh, the most relevant spots to look, uh, determine what's you know truly a PBS and what's not. Uh, so this is kind of a nice, uh, you know, image representation of what this is doing. Uh, so if this is your ground truth, your attention map is saying these are the hot spots, right? These are the spots where these occur the most. And I, I think this is a really powerful architecture for this because the PBS are super spatially dependent, right? They only happen, uh, the one, at least the ones we're interested in, are only happen in the basal ganglia and the CS. So these are like really spatially confined uh, given an entire 3D volume. Uh, so we're using this network. Uh, he's developing it now. Uh, using kind of a standard uh, cross attention network to, to see if we can clean up these segmentations. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, uh, options that we're also looking at in terms of like the loss function we use for this. Uh, we're probably going to use focal diversity loss, which is a nice way of controlling the rate of false positives to false negatives. Again, I'm super conservative by nature, so I'll probably try to eliminate as many false positives uh, as possible, even at the risk of, you know, some false negatives. Uh, but this is kind of in progress. We're working on it now. Uh, hopefully we'll be done in uh, two or three weeks. And then we can apply it to all the stroke data that Roger sent us, which is about 460, I think, patients. Uh, and then he has some really cool ideas about how we can relate this to uh, language outcomes in all these left hemisphere uh, chronic stroke patients. <clears throat> 
Uh, so with that, I just want to give some acknowledgments uh, to my team that was working with me here. Uh, like I said, I'm the only PhD, but we have a lot of great MDs who have helped uh, along the way with kind of generating ground truths. Uh, Akanksha did the initial 35, the ratings for the initial 35 that I used uh, for the optimization. Uh, Bhagashree is currently cleaning up uh, 100 segmentations that we can use to train the cross-attention network, uh, which is probably the most torturous part of the, the process, so I super appreciate her help on that. Uh, this is Balaji. He's the engineering student that I'm uh, working with to develop the cross-attention network. Uh, Lily and Natala are two of the neuroradiologists here who are uh, experts in small vessel disease and uh, grading it in stroke uh, populations. So they kind of helped Akanksha and Bhagashree, you know, understand uh, the pathology. Uh, and Natala is kind of the leader of the lab. So I couldn't have done any of this without, <clears throat> the, especially the original paper, without the grants that she's received. Uh, and the kind of mentorship she's provided. So I just wanted to give a thank you to all of those people. And then here's my references. So uh, I guess I'll open the floor to questions. Thank you very much, Brady. <laughs> so, um, thank, and, and I know I forgot to tell the audience before you started that I know you're very interested in, in uh, uh, in finding new collaborators as well to work on these data, right? So if we have audience members that have large data sets, uh, please contact Brady Williamson. <laughs> yeah, and uh, honest, large, small data sets, I don't care. Like, I'm, I'm so passionate about, like, you know, imaging, imaging analysis in relation to, you know, neuropsychological outcomes. I'm open to any collaboration at all. Uh, so, yeah, feel free to contact me if you're interested. Excellent. Um, I started um, typing in some questions during your talk. Um, I am not much of a methodologist like you are on the technical side. So, so my questions are, are really more about the, like the application and what do you think it predicts, right? So uh, I understand if that, if that is not your part of the field either, but in that case, just, just let me know. So one of my first questions was, so to what extent do you think the enlarged perivascular spaces are a direct function of the stroke itself, like a result of the stroke? Uh, versus an individual uh, trait that you would also see pre-morbidly. Sure. And so would you expect these values to be predictive of language function in healthy individuals or primarily to predict recovery from stroke? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, something I've definitely thought about a lot. Uh, you know, we're using these acute uh, clinical scans uh, for a lot of this research. And uh, basically, we're assuming that the small vessel disease present was present before the stroke uh, because they're, you know, so acute, they're less than 24 hours. Uh, there's definitely been some evidence that the, uh, that, you know, lacunar, especially lacunar strokes lead to this uh, super, you know, spread of perivascular spaces and the basal ganglia. Uh, so when this, when this was first described back in like the 1860s, I think, uh, the, it was a French uh, anatomist who first came up with this, uh, you know, observation, and he called it the uh, etat crible. I don't know, I, I, I'm not, you know, my French pronunciation probably isn't right, uh, but it's basically uh, a sieve-like appearance, right? So if you see these like really bad perivascular spaces in the basal ganglia, it looks like a sieve, right? You see like tons of little uh, dots, and those are most common after uh, lacunar infarct. So I think it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, related uh, to stroke, uh, especially ischemic stroke, uh, but the evidence is far less, uh, I guess, uh, you know, numerous in terms of uh, low bar ischemic stroke. Uh, but I think that's definitely one of the things that, you know, we're exploring uh, with Roger is that if you have this nice homogeneous data set of left hemisphere strokes uh, and a really nice neuropsychological battery of language assessment, uh, you know, can you, uh, does it correlate, does the number of PBS uh, correlate with language function, you know, after that stroke? So I think that's something that we're definitely actively exploring. Uh, but it's an interesting concept of, uh, you know, whether these are actually predictive of cognitive outcome after the stroke, uh, since we usually don't have a baseline in these stroke patients. So, Okay, thanks. Um, I also wonder, in terms of the characterization of the uh, abnormalities, if you will, whether um, you have a sense of, of whether it's the, the sheer number of abnormalities or their relative size that might be most predictive of function, or are those two so heavily correlated that it really doesn't make a difference? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question too. Uh, 
I think that, you know, when we do this, I'll definitely send both the count and the volume. Uh, I don't know if we can give, I don't know, uh, I would have to think about a little bit on the utility of actually, you know, classifying the volume of each individual lesion and then, you know, uh, seeing if there's some kind of gradation of, you know, if you have more, uh, if you have more PVS that are greater than, you know, seven millimeters, then you have this outcome versus that. Uh, that's an interesting thought. I, that makes me think of one, one aspect of these that I didn't mention is that in the syndrome of valley, sometimes you get a secondary kind of uh, pathology on the imaging that are kind of these like, uh, for lack of a better term, like lines that go out kind of towards, uh, towards the cortex. Uh, the name is escaping me right now. There's a clinical name for it, uh, but uh, those are actually more indicative of worse outcome if you have PBS and that secondary to the PBS. Uh, that are directly related to the perivascular spaces, uh, then you actually have worse outcomes. Uh, so it could be that there's some underlying signal that maybe we're not picking up, uh, you know, traditionally that might be more predictive, which might lead to some of the, the mixed results that we've seen so far. Uh, but that's definitely something to explore, kind of volume versus count. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, like, I don't think you'd necessarily need to have the, the size of each individual uh, space in there but if you if you have the total volume which you that's easy right and you have yeah. the number you just um, divide one by the other basically exactly. that, that would give you like an average size and that, that might actually be it it's possible but that's an even stronger uh, but yeah that's that's a great point I hadn't thought about that but that's a really great point thank you I didn't have any other questions on my list. I don't see other questions from our audience audience if you have questions type them now. And otherwise, you can always contact Dr. Williamson, of course.